So the need for this kind of work was uh, urgent enough in 2014. Uh, since then, we've seen escalating ecological problems, of which the pandemic is one consequence, and an impetus in many countries towards forms of nationalism that undermine cooperation and public will for environmental action. At the same time, movements like Extinction Rebellion have stressed the ever greater urgency for action. So there's a need for transformative work that is more urgent than ever. And yet that urgency needs to be held in tension with practices like those in this book, which open calm, reflective spaces in which people can discover change within themselves. So in this session now, we're first going to hear some, from the editorial team, some micro extracts from the book. Uh, then there'll be a discussion Mama. with our distinguished guests about story work in relation to the environmental agenda. Then we'll hear a story. And then if there's, if there's time, and I'm aware we are running 10 minutes late at the moment, um, we hope to respond to some of your questions. That's exactly right. So over to you, John. You're here, John. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Alida. So um, we thought for those that, and it's great just reading through the chat. <clears throat> some people have read it, some are halfway through reading it. Um, for those that haven't read it, um, we just give you a little flavor. So each of us, five of us, are on the editorial panel uh, for the book and all contributed to the book as well. Um, I'm just going to give you a little a little flavor. We've chosen some of our sort of favorite bits, each of us, to give you a flavor of the book before we go on to hear from um, our speakers for tonight. So we're going to speak to this background. So you can just get a nice natural world background. And Charlene is going to kick us off with her thoughts and we extract from the book. <laughs> Thanks, Charlene. Thank you. This is from, uh, from Hidden Paths by Malcolm Green and Nick Hennessy, a chapter in the book. Respectful awareness of reciprocity between people and landscape should be a cornerstone of sustainable living. We wanted to explore how story and storytelling might foster this sense of reciprocity. In our audiences, yes, but first in ourselves. I love this quote because regarding nature as something to use up and extract from rather than a living entity that we are in relationship with is such a root cause of our devastating ecological dilemma. If we're going to learn to live sustainably, we need to rediscover that reciprocity between humans and the natural world. We give to nature and nature gives back to us. The practices that they describe in this book and in this chapter show us how to be with and in a place and through a deep relationship to it, to give life to stories that can help others to sense and enter into that reciprocal exchange. Thanks, Charlene. Um, so um, the extract that I chose from the chapter is uh, from one of the chapters is the chapter by Ashley Ramsden, quite a well known storyteller in this country. Uh, and it's on the jewels of Indra's net. That's what it's called. And it's how the experiential story works that we can all work with can generate a deeper sense of our own interconnectedness with the world um, and how that can set us off on a path towards behaviors. And it feels to me that what's changed a lot since 2014 when we published the book, there's been a growing sense, I think, of isolation, disconnection from what is true and what is real and also from our communities. We have fake news, we have increasing loneliness, which in the developed world, the Western world in particular, is probably our biggest killer. And Connection is a continuous theme through the book, but particularly in Ashley's chapter. Um, 
which is, and the book's all about telling one's own story, but also mixing that in with myth. And there's nothing quite like that when you're sat around a fire in a community wood, city of Worcester, which is where I'm from. And often it can be an anecdote that can offer hope in terms of offering that sense of connection. So here's an extract from Ashley's chapter. In Hindu mythology, for example, it, interdependence and connection, is portrayed magnificently in the image of Indra's net. Indra, king of the gods, wished to show his subjects the wisdom of the world he created. So he ordered that a net be spread above his palace as spacious as the sky. And wherever the net's threads crossed, Indra placed a multifaceted jewel. And the smallest change in any part of that infinite net sparkled in every jewel. And the chapter goes on to talk about how we, in fact, all life are the sparkles and how do we work with that with groups and work with our own stories of connection. Indra's jewels. Over to you, Alida. Yeah, it's a good point of connection here. So I too will offer a quote from the chapter by Hidden Past that was written by Malcolm Green and Nick Hennessy. And the chapter's theme is developing stories about a local environment. Because one of the temptations is to go far away to find nature connection, but it's also about finding it close to our home, wherever we are. The quote says, we invite you to try out the methods that we've described to get to know a chosen area in reach of where you live in order to nurture your own, my own connectedness to place and thereby to bring a deeper stillness and ecological feeling to the people you work with, or in my case, the people I work with. Comment. Research has shown that facilitators of pro-environmental change are more effective in their work, in our work, when we radiate this kind of inner connectedness to place. We need to do that because we need to really try whatever we can do to prevent catastrophic global warming. And the message that Malcolm and Nick described and the message that all the other 20 authors described, they can help us maybe a little bit or maybe a lot to get that way, to limit the risk that faces us. So, I'm the next one. I think you're the next one, Mr. Shetland. Buck Shetland, Edward Shetland for you. What does it look like when a person's empathy begins to move in a pro-environmental direction? How do we know that storytelling and related creative activities are effective in achieving this? The chapter, A Riverside Journey by Sarah Hurley and Alida Gersey, describes a project in which mixed heritage families attended a series of outdoor workshops along the River X. The goal was to give them a sense of belonging in their environment <clears throat> and a wish to sustain it. At the end of the first day of the workshops, a 10-year-old participant wrote this poem. Like a river, I meet different people. Like the sea, I go to different places. Like the water cycle, we sometimes have to start all over again. Like a tributary, we see each other in all sorts of different places. Like a stream, we have to say our goodbyes. In a nutshell, showing how to generate this kind of feelingfulness, feelingful connectedness with nature is what this book is about. 
the next is, is Anthony. 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 In, in the book's introduction, we say this systematic process of listening and responding enables the participants to fine tune and develop their empathic capacity in a situation where reciprocal actions are expected. A strong empathic ability enables them to be more compassionate towards themselves, towards others, and towards the more than human world." End of quote. Ecological action requires more than information. It requires that people care. The power of stories is that they bring feelings into play. And when people engage with stories together, there can be a sharing of feelings, a sense of connection in which people care about each other, care about what's in the stories, and care about possible implications in the world. I hope that's given you a little flavour of what the book's about. And the key for me was it's it's using stories to enable people to create their own stories often in terms of making those connections. Um, and talking about connections, we've connected with three other people in the field that Charlene is going to introduce to you. Thank you, John. Yes, so those of us who were involved in the book project um, reached out to some others who, uh, who are new to us, but were using story in some very interesting ways. So I'm really pleased to introduce a, a panelist of, of three story practitioners. Um, we have with us Lisa Schneider, who is a storyteller, an author, an environmentalist who's based in Devon. We have Dr. Alan Kellis, who's the Green Leader for the Royal College of Psychiatry, and Robin Webster, the Senior Program Officer at Climate Outreach. So I'm going to have a, a short conversation with each of them to ask them to describe the different ways that they work with story in their very different field of practice. And we're going to start with you, Lisa. So as a, as a bit of an introduction to Lisa, um, Lisa, you've worked in the nature conservation sector for the last 25 years in roles including farm advisor, a river surveyor, a political lob lobbyist, and a conservation director. Um, your work with Devon Li Wildlife Trust was managing and developing landscape scale conservation programs. And you're now a full-time storyteller, writing features and articles on wildlife storytelling in the land. And you've written two books on British folk tales. So, um, and many other things besides. And what I'm interested in hearing is how has this book inspired your practice? And in particular, how has it encouraged you to take your practice to reach beyond the usual nice storytelling audiences to very different parts of society? Over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Charlene. And um, thanks everyone for inviting me along. I, I hope that I am quite an effective guinea pig for your book because when the original book came out in 2014, I was just gearing up. I'd been working with storytelling for a while, but I was just beginning that, I guess, transition between my wildlife trust career, very science-based, fact-based, practical-based, um, towards storytelling and the environment in, in a kind of serious way. And it is a, a very wonderful book that you have created here. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who has been involved in putting it together. Um, it is a very generous book, and it's not just a generous book because of all of the contributions of experience in it, but it is always, always written with that generosity towards the environment, with environment at its core, and that makes it quite an unusual storytelling book, because of course stories are often traditional stories, a human construct. So pretty radical stuff for me um, at just the right time. It's also a book that has got a lot of practical examples of how a story can be used, and it is very, very diverse. So I found it incredibly inspiring and still going back to it, um, particularly on work going on now, actually, Charlene, in your area about futures. So I first started out um, 
really working in the environmental sector for charities and mainly advice to farmers, advice outside of nature reserves, right the way through to political lobbying where anything emotional was a no-no. One of the things that first attracted me to storytelling as an environmental concern was the ability of storytelling to connect with the emotions. Um, I've just worked up a storytelling piece uh, during lockdown about the ash tree and that partly was in response to being one of but also seeing an awful lot of people working in the sector who were absolutely wrecked with grief about ash dieback and about the transformation in our landscape which is underway, which is just wretched, difficult to know what to do with. Um, and working story with that, the idea was to try to offer it as something which helps to work through that and come out perhaps the other side of the grief curve. Um, and that's still ongoing. I've done a lot of work with seeking stories of the land and seeking little folktale, um, little stories of place that perhaps talk about our relationship and how that relationship has changed with nature over time. And inevitably that means that I'm very um, based in those environments that I've lived in and worked in and know in Britain and Ireland and those where I have connections with family myself as well. I think that question of different audiences, Charlene, is a really important one because the environmental sector is overwhelmingly white, middle class and nice, wretchedly so. And it's been wonderful to find examples in this book of different audiences, um, real efforts to listen and real efforts to um, meet people in lots of different circumstances. Um, and that really inspires me because if we are ever to achieve anything, we need to reach out to new audiences. I think the audiences that are calling me most at the moment are actually those who work the land. Farming is an incredibly um, divided sector with industrial scale, um, in my view, utterly disrespectful land practices on the one hand that uh, go way past environmental limits and precious things that produce food that most people can't afford on the other and everything in between. It's a very laden sector to work within. There's something to me deeply inspiring about story that makes that a little less personal and allows more of an exploration of it. And I am currently exploring that at the moment with performance storytelling and trying to find ways of reflecting some of those voices back in a way which is helpful. Um, I could crash and burn yet, we'll, <laughs> we'll wait and see. But I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, but certainly this book, I would recommend it to anybody who wants to dip their toe in the water of using story for environmental purpose and for environmental exploration. It's, it's a cracker, it's really good. Thank you, Lisa. So I'm now going to turn to, uh, to Alan and um, with a, a brief introduction. Um, well, it's, it's, it's difficult to be brief. Um, with Alan because he's done quite a lot. Um, he's worked as a GP and a psychiatrist in the NHS since the 80s, mostly with adults and children with learning disabilities. And for the last 10 years, he's been exploring the role of nature and mental health, both in his own self-care and also in critical practice. Um, he's been a nature representative in the Royal College of, of Psychiatrists Sustainability Committee, and he was involved in that college's statement on climate and ecological emergency. He's been advisor to a pilot project on nature-based prescribing in Bristol, focusing on nature connections for disadvantaged people. So a whole um, field of practice in the area of mental health. And Alan, tell us some of the ways that you use stories in your practice to, to foster a sense of connection to nature or a sense of place or to oneself. Mm, thanks, Charlene. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks, John, for inviting me tonight. Um, I must admit that when I got the invitation, I really um, had to question what my connection is with storytelling as such. But I just wanted to give you a flavour of how even now the book has done benefits because it's got me thinking about areas and connections that I didn't really think about before. 
I guess the main one that I'd like to share is um, having done a sort of medical training and a psychiatric training, the essence of medicine is what we call taking a, a history or taking a story. So the whole practice of medicine, whether it's understanding a pain or understanding a symptom um, before even an examination or an investigation, just listening to the story is just a, an essence of, of medicine. And all the more so when, um, when coming to try to understand and help people with mental health needs of different sorts. The field that I'm in, um, what one might call developmental difficulties, it's like there's layers and layers of stories that any particular presentation you're trying to understand what might have been the story that comes from a family, maybe a genetic tree, the stories of a pregnancy, the stories of infancy, the stories of child development, to try to tease out from that story what might be clues for understanding and clues for help. Um, but I think, I mean, you mentioned too that what, what's changing in psychiatric practice, um, partly resisting all of the pressures around data and reducing human experience down to figures and numbers, um, is this question about, well, what about climate and nature and how do they fit into the stories, the big stories that lie behind us? That's part of what has been going on in the college. Um, and family therapy work is, is all about trying to create stories that might be co-created. So story listening, story making skills, I, I've come to see, thanks partly to the book, are, are really essential um, to my practice. And, and I'm just going to think a lot more thanks to the book. But I thought I'd just tell you three little um, stories that I remember from my own practice. Um, the first, uh, first few weeks of being a psychiatric trainee, I was on call and called to um, a young student nurse who was in crisis. And it was one of these cases where I had to test my risk assessments and assess her risk of suicidality. And I just remember how our conversation changed having done all of that. We went outside just to sit on a bench outside the ward where all the cigarette stubs are. And just the process of looking up, seeing through the trees, seeing the moon and looking at stars suddenly changed something that went on between us. I think something changed in her, but it certainly changed in me. Just how you tell, listen to a story changes in where you, where you hear it. Then later, I thought I'd just quickly tell you about the story of um, uh, Mary and how I wrote a psychiatric report for commissioners about how... I felt it was really important that she went to a mermaid academy. Um, and that was because um, quite an autistic person with a really fractured uh, history in a very complex, challenging setup with two staff at all times in a bespoke home. But the one thing that she loved was uh, water and um, the mermaid fins that she had in her home were pretty much the only thing she wanted to talk about. So just following her particular story and recognising that blue health benefits of being in on and near water um, can be a clue to helping someone really discover something important about themselves. And, and, and the third thing I just quickly wanted to share was the story of um, Jacob, um, a young man who came and taught to medical students and um, I love the way he told the students that he goes to this stable um, where there are quite, there are rescue horses. And he was telling the students how traumatized the horses were and how important it was for him to learn how to control his own breathing and his own touch and his own sound making, because that was the only way that the horses would calm down. Um, and it was a story really of how in no other way could he have found the need and the skills to practice his own emotional regulation. It was the gift and the benefits of the relationship with the horse that allowed him to, um, to find that. And, and he finished by also just in, in the wonderful way that people on the spectrum can share with us just how important looking after the neighborhood is. And in his particular case, he loved picking up litter and um, he was just a brilliant litter picker. And he, uh, he dominated his local neighborhood discussions and ended up becoming a, um, 
uh, a community champion as a litter picker um, because of his particular skills, which in many other circumstances might have been considered rather an obsessional special interest that might be disabling. But um, we certainly all had a, a lot to learn from him and, and he's given an awful lot to his community. So um, I don't know if that gives you a flavour, Charlene, of some stories from practice and how um, keeping nature in mind is, I think, growingly important in anyone working in the mental health field. And I think we've got a lot to learn from storytellers and story makers like yourselves. And thanks for the book. Thank you, Ellen. And I think it gives us a wonderful image of how story can be a, a bridge for people to touch into their own narrative or how they collect, connect to a certain narrative. And that's a, a, a great um, segue to introduce Robin and, and Robin's work. Um, so thank you, Alan. And by way of introduction to Robin, Robin has over 20 years experience as a writer, as an advisor and a campaigner on environmental issues and climate change. She's worked on a wide range of issues, including UK and international climate policy, how the UK media covers climate change and um, land use change. Particular interests are around the communication of climate science and so called social and psychological responses to the ways the climate is changing. So she's written many, I think, three to 400 articles on climate and energy policy and uh, NGO publications on um, environmental and climate issues. So, Robin, you're very involved in helping people to connect with the climate story. Tell us a bit about how you do that and what are some of the ways that you work with story to help people engage in action on climate change? Thanks, Charlene, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the, for the invitation. Um, I guess just to tell a little bit of my own story in answering that question, um, I came from uh, a similar journey, I think, to Lisa, um, of working in that technical lobbying field. And I was just thinking when you said about writing three to 400 articles, I was thinking how many of them talked about the parts of the million and sustainability and trajectories and, and all those words. Um, and I worked in that field for a long time and wrote a lot of materials that, um, that use that language and that story about climate change. A lot of the time thinking, this is very odd. Um, and this is a very strange way of talking about a fundamental and existential change to, to who we are and to our lives. Um, so the job I do now is I work for Climate Outreach and we are a, a charity that is that sort of position ourselves bet between science, between the social science of, of how people talk and think and understand about climate change and the activists, the practitioners, people like yourselves, every, anyone who's out there in the world trying to get people to, to talk and think and understand about climate change and to think about how can we support people in, uh, in, in doing it better and in particularly in reaching different sorts of people and telling different sorts of stories. Um, and I think I see myself sort of not as a, as a storyteller or to use Martin Shaw's phrase, a story carrier, but more of a story facilitator. Um, and in sort of thinking about how you can facilitate others to find their own story in the climate story and um, uh, some work that I did fairly early on in this job um, is, is we wrote a handbook about how to have conversations in your day-to-day -day life about climate change, um, just with the people around you. And knowing that so many of us, probably many of us on this call still, can get stuck in that strange dynamic if you're talking to someone who um, perhaps doesn't agree with all your views, where you feel that you have to have some kind of fact battle about you know, sea level rise in 2050 or something like that. And just thinking, actually, how can we talk to each other as humans? And particularly, how can we listen to each other as humans about what's what's going on around us? Um, and one exercise in that talking climate work is literally a deep listening exercise where you get person A and person B and person B asks person A a set of simple questions like, when did you start caring about climate change? What are you doing about it now? How do you feel about that? And let's person A tell their story. And I have to say, doing that turn and turn about is one of the best uses of 10 minutes I've ever felt found in my life because people just tell such powerful stories um, and they find themselves in the climate change story. And I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, and people feel a sense of validity that they have actually got something to talk about in climate change. And I think this for me, that's why this book is something really, really powerful. I actually found myself passing it on to one of my very rational uh, colleagues this morning saying you should read this book um, and it will uh, help you to because we have so many conversations with practitioners with activists about things like um, how do you talk to different sorts of people how do you talk to people who aren't lefty progressive activists 
um, and some of the stuff about, for example, finding yourself in in place. How do you talk about your your local environment in place? And to give one example of the kind of work that we do, we do audience segmentation approach. So we've kind of divide through research, divided thoughts about the different sorts of people that exist in the UK. And one kind of audience segment, uh, which is uh, sort of about 13 or 14 percent of the UK population, British population, called loyal nationals. Um, and this describes people who are probably um, uh, more likely to vote conservative than many of us on this call, perhaps Brexit voting, more drawn to kind of populist, populist political perspectives, um, but also people who reflect this identity have a very strong sense of concern about climate change and the local environment. And the often express a very, very strong sense of environment as a, as a local place-based issue, as themselves placed, placed in their local environment, and that's where their concern lies. So if the story that we tell about climate change is always about international negotiations and elites, um, and even if it's always about um, you know, ground source heat pumps and all the rest of it, what you're not actually talking about is this as a place, as a story, which is about you, which is about you placed in, in, in your local world. So you can't, it's perhaps it's not that surprising that people who share that identity find the stories that we tell about climate change off-putting, not reflective of the way they, they think about the world. So often as a facilitator, as someone who works in this area, what I'm trying to do is find ways of telling the climate story in different ways, but often to find ways, the sort of phrase trusted messengers, to find ways people who share that identity to tell their own story. It's not up to me to, to talk about how climate change affects all of us, but sometimes to try and give people the, the sense of empowerment that they can that they can tell their own story and talk to people like them who trust them and share their own values. And that feels like something really, really core to myself, core to what we do. I think this sense about the story of climate change and being able to place ourselves in it. So many of us share that sense of grief and overwhelm that Lisa was talking about. And I think, and that's partly because it's very anatomizing, individualizing the story we've been told about climate change. Like it's either about big politics or it's about turning a light bulb off. But actually what it's about is about community and it's about change it happens across society and governments are influenced by what they see happening across society because it's so it's a, it's, a, it's a circle. Like what we do with us and the people around us and the stories we have around us matter and they influence the larger systemic change that's happened and those two things interact. Um, so I think the only thing I want to say finally is one of the things I really love about these stories in this book is a lot of them are gritty, like they're not, they're not too pastel, um, <laughs> they're real. Um, and I think sometimes in trying to send, sell visions of the future, climate activists have slightly fallen into the trap of trying to be a little bit too clean and easy and actually we know that this is a gritty and difficult process and being authentic and real about that is a, is a real core part of telling good stories. Thank you so much, Robin and Alan and, and Lisa. You know, you've all shared with us in very different ways how either um, finding the right story to tell or helping somebody else find their own story to tell and just that process of sharing can really unlock different ways for people to engage um, with nature or, or with their relation to nature. So thank you very much for sharing your experiences and your, you know, your work on the coalface um, of your different professions. So um, a thank you to the panelists. And I'm now going to hand back to Buck, who will introduce our storyteller for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene and our panelists. <clears throat> now it is is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce this evening's storyteller. Malcolm Green is widely known in the UK and abroad as a pioneer in the use of storytelling in environmental education. His powerful evocative tales, drawn widely from folk traditions, historical events, scientific studies, and personal encounters, exemplify the capacity of storytelling to bring us to a deeper experience of our relationship with and participation in the natural world. Malcolm, take us away. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Little wave, <laughs> a lot of um, faces I know, quite a few I don't. Yeah, great to be here in this little um, gathering together. 
And of course, there's loads of different kinds of stories, aren't there? From we've got folk tales and myths and legends, and we've got our own personal tales, and we've got stories we might call real life stories. And they all have kind of fuzzy edges, one kind of becoming another. And uh, the story I've chosen tonight is one which I probably veers on the kind of real life story, personal story, not mine, I should say. And it's the story of a, of a wee boy, he's a wee boy called Geordie. And Geordie lives in a little village in Spain uh, with his mum and dad and in a, in a humble little house. And each day when he comes back from school in the spring and the summer, he used to go to his cousin's house, which was the other side of the village. And as the day drew to a close and it started to become evening time, Geordie would wander home back to his house with his with mom and dad. But he'd very often stop at the old church. The old church that looked out over the fields and woods that surrounded their village. And he'd wait underneath the church in anticipation. And there'd be a tingling in his body, which was a mixture of fear and excitement. For they would come flying out of the top of the church, the two white birds, the barn owls. They would come on wings so soft that they were utterly silent. It was a silence that some people called the silence of death. And it would give Geordie a little shudder when they went across for he, he knew the stories. He knew the stories that were told by his grandparents and other old people in the village that owls, you see, held the spirits of people who had died and had not found anywhere to rest. And so there he saw this being, this beautiful creature flying, quartering the fields outside of the village. But there was something else that happened to him when he saw those owls. There was a thrill in him too. For it was as if they were calling him, as if they were inviting him to step into another world, another dimension. And in those, that moment, in their wildness, he felt more alive than he ever felt at any other time. And so that was his regular stopping underneath the church. And one evening he was coming back and he waited as he always did underneath the church, but the owls didn't come. It wasn't the first time, but it wasn't usual. He usually saw them. And when he arrived back at his house, he went through the little lobby into the front door and there was the old fridge which had been sitting there for as long as he could remember, you know, with little rusty bits down the side and the creaking door. And on top of the fridge, there was a cardboard box. It wasn't there when he had left earlier in the day. He wondered what was in it. He thought he could hear a sound coming from in the box. And he went into the kitchen and he said to his mother, mum, what's in the box? And she said, ah, it's your father. The priest asked him to catch the owls in the church to give to a benefactor on the edge of the village as a gift. And Geordie said, and what's he going to do with them? Oh, she said, uh, I expect he'll have them mounted to decorate his living room. And in that moment, Geordie thought, ornament. He's going to make those precious wild beings into ornaments. And he wanted to scream and he wanted to yell, but any words got stuck in his throat for fear he would reveal something. And so Geordie just bowed his head and he walked out of the kitchen. And that evening, as usual, they had dinner together, mum, dad and Geordie, and nothing more was spoken about the owls in the box. And Geordie went to bed that evening 
And, you know, he put his head on that pillow and he couldn't think about anything else than those beautiful creatures. Those beautiful creatures that called him and invited him into a different world. And he found himself, well, it was almost unconscious, getting out of bed and in his pajamas, tiptoeing down the stairs, as soft as he could, past his parents' bedroom, through the living room and the kitchen. And there he was, standing next to that box. And of course, the scratching was loud now for they were creatures of the night and this was their time. And as he looked at the box, he didn't know if what he was about to do was the right or the wrong thing. But what he did know was that it was too late to change his mind. And so he walked out of the little lobby into the garden and there was an old rusty table there. And he put the box on the table and he was frightened. He was frightened of his father, but he was more frightened of the owls, so close to these beings of death. And he opened the lid. First one owl flew out straight off into the trees, but the second owl hopped onto the lip of the box. It turned its head right round like only owls can do and stared at him straight in the eyes. Now, Geordie didn't know if that owl looked at him for a second, 10 seconds, 10 minutes. For in that moment, there is no time. But he knew one thing for sure. And that was the owl was saying, thank you. And as soon as he had heard that, she turned her head around and flew off into the trees. And there was Geordie left with an empty box and a problem. And he went back into the lobby and he put the box back on the old fridge and he made it look like the owls had pushed their way out and he left the back door a little bit open like his parents never did. And he went back to bed. And you can imagine he didn't sleep much that night. And when he came down to breakfast in the morning, he heard his mother saying to his father, you better tell the priest that the owls have gone. And then his father walked into the, into the, into the, into the breakfast room with, uh, with his son and with a completely poker face. And Geordie had no idea. Nothing more was said. He went to school as he always did. He came back in the evening. And again, they sat around for their evening meal. No word, nothing said about the owl. And it was time for bed and Geordie walked up to bed. He got under the covers, pulling his his eider down close under his chin. For you know, that was the days of eider downs. And he heard his father's footsteps on the stairs and he heard them coming to his room. And he did what any of us would have done in that moment, he pretended he was asleep. And then he heard the handle of his door turn and he felt the weight of his father's body as he sat on the end of his bed. And then he felt his father's hand on his head. And he heard his father say, son, I'm proud of you. And that story is a true story from a, a Spanish man. And when I talked to him about it, he said that that moment changed his life, that decision. And he ended up becoming a wildlife photographer and a vet. And I just wanted to, it's a story for me about how a young person can show an older person what matters. 
Thank you. Wow. That was a lovely moving story, Malk. Thank you. <laughs> You've done it again. <laughs> that was wonderful. And now we come to the final part of our launch. I don't know if we have much time. Uh, and I turn us over to Alida. Hello. <clears throat> I've been there at the beginning and I'm there at the end. And what is so wonderful about this evening is that neither the beginning nor the end are as we planned. But what has been in between has been very moving for me. Thank you to all three of you who have contributed so beautifully to the panel. Thank you, Charlene, for hosting it. Thank you, John, too, for our movie. And thank you, Anthony, too, for your words. And especially, Malcolm, thank you for the story. And thank you, Buck. Now, the one person who was meant to be there at the beginning, but couldn't yet, but I believe is there now, is Martin Large. So, Martin, can you show yourself our publisher? And would Thank you. you. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm very sorry about the technical glitches. That's a whole other story. But I'm delighted that so many people have been sharing on chat their experiences for storytelling for a nature connection. And I just hope all you storytellers and educators and wardens and guides can really use storytelling to change our, our narrative and that you can get together more to share your learning and the stories about how you're using this approach because boy don't we need your story magic to change the narrative so thank you all and thank you the panel and thank you for contributing and participating and again apologies about the technology thank well, you Martin, without you and without Horton Press, this book might have traveled a while longer to find <laughs> another publisher, but that publisher might not have had the heart, the warmth, and the generosity that you have put into it. So thank a you. very warm thank you, and a very warm thank you for imagining giving the book another title and another lease of life and another journey into life and living. So on behalf of all of us, a very warm thank you to you. And to Katie and Susie, our technical people who have been dealing with great panics and worries and whatnot else behind the screens. But nonetheless, thank you, you've made it possible. So for whatever you went through in those 20 minutes, half an hour, when all seemed lost, and maybe that is the metaphor that all of us can take into our future. When all seems lost, make contact, talk to each other. Say, as Charlene said, I'll just wait. And John said, I'll just wait. And Malcolm and Buck and you all, he probably all said, we'll wait and we'll try again. So may that be the message that all of us will take into our respective worlds wait but don't wait too long and try again so let us say goodbye and thank you all for being here tonight with us it's been an honor go safely a recording is being made any questions that are in the chat we will try to deal with within the next fortnight so go safely and above all enjoy as well as we can in these tough times Bye. Bye-bye.